friends, a very warm welcome as the temperature plummets outside to your carol service here at St. Bottles without Bishopsgate, your church and your carol service. On behalf of Padre Mark, uh, Padre to the uh, Honourable, Honourable Artillery Company, uh, and myself, Father David Armstrong, Padre to Veterans Aid, uh, it is a great privilege to be with you this evening. During the service, the singing of Good King Wenceslas, uh, during the service, there will be a collection for the work of Veterans Aid. If you can, may I ask that you give generously to this good work. Well, as you can see, the tree is twinkling. The choir, I can assure you, is in good voice. I hope you are too. Veterans Aid are back at St. Bottles. There are carols to be sung. So all in all, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. <laughs> so on behalf of all at St. Bottles, may I take this opportunity to wish you a very happy Christmas when it comes and a peaceful and fulfilling new year. Let us pray. Beloved in Christ, be it this Christmas tide our care and delight to hear again the message of the angels and in heart and mind to go even on to Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass and the babe lying in a manger. Let us therefore read and mark in Holy Scripture the tale of the loving purposes of God from the first days of our disobedience unto the glorious redemption brought us by this holy child. But first, let us pray for the needs of the whole world, for peace on earth and goodwill among all his people, for unity, sisterhood and brotherhood within the church he came to build, and especially in this great city of London. And because this of all things would rejoice his heart, let us remember in his name <coughs> the poor and helpless, the cold, the hungry and the oppressed, the sick and them that mourn, the lonely and the unloved, the aged and the little children, all those who know not the Lord Jesus or who love him not or who by sin have grieved his heart of love, and lastly, let us remember before God all those who rejoice with us, but upon another shore and in a greater light, that multitude which no one can number, whose hope was in the word made flesh and with whom in the Lord Jesus we are forever one. These prayers and praises let us humbly offer up to the throne of heaven, in the words which Christ himself has taught us, saying together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. May the Almighty God bless us with his grace. Christ, give us the joys of everlasting life. And on to the fellowship of the citizens above, may the King of angels bring us all. Angel Gabriel salutes the Blessed Virgin Mary. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hey, 
thou art highly favoured. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this could be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angels, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Thanks be to God. St. Luke tells of the birth of Jesus. 
And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all in the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with his wife, his espoused Mary, being great with child. And so it was that, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Thanks be to God. The shepherds go to the manger, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, 
Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now, now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary, and Joseph, and the babe, lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things, and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. Thanks be to God. The wise men are led by the star to Jesus. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he, that king uh, of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king heard that these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. 
And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it was written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not least among the princes of Judea. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were uh, to come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Thanks be to God.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I joined the army for the first time, some 30 years ago, there were often service personnel dotted around my regiment who were clearly, to put it bluntly, not at their peak performance. In those days, there was an unwritten rule that we looked after our own. We knew the inevitable sacrifice enacted or extracted by a relentless tempo of training, deployments and operations. And we understood the power of comradeship that binds a unit that has trained together, deployed together and sometimes fought together. And how some people became dependent on that shared experience of service and how vital it was as they saw it when their service ended. We understood that there was a code of honour. Once part of the family, always a part of the family. And in those days, the armed forces had the space to carry many who were struggling. Asked to do, if necessary, the almost unthinkable, to risk life and limb and inflict violence if necessary, we believed that a debt was owed. No doubt soldiering is a profession, and for most, a vocation. But I would argue it is not like any other form of service. It isn't employment as such. It's an act of felty. It always involves sacrifice, not just on the battlefield. And the British people, I believe, feel the same. The British people overwhelmingly believes that a debt is owed to those who are serving or have served. It's a debt that they want to see honoured. And yet over the years, the size of the armed forces has declined. And at the same time, the tempo of training, of deployments and operations has been maintained, if not increased. Over the years 2001 and 2014, some 280,000 members of the armed forces were deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq. At the time, the size of the armed forces over that period was on average 140,000. There was no longer, there no longer is the room or the funding to continue the old unwritten rule. Now it's a fallacy that service personnel are less co able to cope in the real world. They're not. Mental health in the armed forces is generally better when compared to the general population as a whole. And the same is true for those who have left service. But that still leaves many who do struggle, and in particular those who suffer from the physical, the psychological, and the spiritual scars of conflict, which often manifest themselves after the protection of regimental or unit life is no longer there. Homelessness is just but one manifestation of the needs of former service personnel. And for complex reasons, perhaps the cost of relying on the unit for social support during their lifetimes in place of family, it seems that ex-service personnel suffer disproportionately from homelessness. At one point, the Royal British Legion estimated that former service people accounted for some 20% of the homeless in London. Many agencies now believe that number is far too high, but still the number is disp disproportionate and symptomatic of the often tenacious problems that former service personnel can have. That is why I cannot fail to be awed by the passion that Veterans Aid brings to their determination to be there at the sharp end, at need, no matter what. And if you want to test for yourself the intensity of this charity's purpose, I can recommend that you spend even a little time with Wing Commander Dr. Hugh Milroy. His compassion, his energy, and his tenacity are for me the hallmarks of Veterans Aid. It's a charity that refuses not to help, that rejects blanket solutions for the many real and complex problems their clients have. It is a charity that gets on with the job. So this year, Veterans Aid celebrates its 90th anniversary 
of tremendous service. And I can only recommend the charity to all of you and hope and pray that their work continues to be supported by you in the years to come. We are, of course, at a Veterans Aid carol service in which here at St Botos, which has become the spiritual home of the charity, we celebrate the coming of the Prince of Peace. It is a time when we all hope for the best. We want there to be an end to war, for the lamb to lay down with the lion. We want the ill to be healed and the hungry to be fed and for the captive to be freed. The hope which Christ brings is founded on God's love. Love doesn't allow the beloved ill to suffer or the beloved hungry to remain hungry or the beloved prisoner to remain imprisoned. And our faith tells us that there will come a time when our hope will become the reality. Yet we also know that God works through us. If we truly want peace, we must work for true justice. And if we truly want our former service personnel to get the help they need and deserve, yes, we must pray. But also remember that work is a form of prayer. Our hands need to be put to the will. We need to reach out to the former service personnel who may be struggling. And above all, we need to support Veterans Aid. Lastly, of course, it would be remiss if I want to wish you all, your families, your friends and loved ones, a blessed and a peaceful and a very holy Christmas. Amen. Let us pray. Father, your Son, our Saviour, was born in human flesh. Renew your church as the body of Christ. Father, there was no room for your Son in the inn. Protect with your love all those who have no home and all who live in poverty. We pray for veterans who are homeless. We pray for our own homeless community in our church here at St. Bottles without Bishop's Gate. We pray for your blessing and support on the work of Veterans Aid and for all those whom they help. And we pray for and give thanks for the dedication and service of our armed forces. Mary, in pain of labour, brought your son to birth. Hold in your hand, O Lord, all who are in pain or in distress. Father, your Christ came as a light shining in the darkness. Bring comfort to all who suffer in the sadness of our world. Father, the angels sang peace to God's people on earth. Strengthen all those who work for peace and justice in all the world. Father, shepherds in the field heard good tidings of joy. Give us grace to preach the gospel of Christ's redemption. Strangers found the holy family and saw the babe lying in the manger. Bless, O Lord, our homes and all whom we love. Heaven is come down to earth, and earth is risen to heaven. 
Hold in your hand, O Lord, all those who have passed through death in the hope of your coming kingdom. Throughout the world, people celebrate Christ's birth. Open our hearts that he may be born in us today. Father, angels and shepherds, worshipped at the manger throne, receive the worship we offer in fellowship with Mary, Joseph and all the saints, through him who is your Prince of Peace, the Word made flesh. A Christmas Tree by Charles Dickens. I have been looking on this evening at a merry company of children assembled around that pretty German toy, a Christmas tree. The tree was planted in the middle of a round table and towered high above their heads. It was brilliantly lighted by a multitude of little tapers and everywhere sparkled and glittered with bright <coughs> objects. There were rosy-cheeked dolls hiding behind the green leaves, and there were real watches with movable hands at least, and an endless capacity of being wound up, dangling from innumerable twigs. There were French polished tables, chairs and bedsteads, wardrobes, eight-day clocks, and various other articles of domestic furniture, wonderfully made in tin at Wolverhampton, perched among the boughs as 
assist in preparation for some fairy housekeeping. There were jolly broad-faced little men, much more agreeable in appearance than many real men, and no wonder, for their heads took off and showed them to be full of sugar plums. There were fiddles and drums, there were tambourines, books, work boxes, paint boxes, sweet meat boxes, peep show boxes, and all kinds of boxes. There were trinkets for the elder girls, far brighter than any grown up gold and jewels. There were baskets and pincushions in all devices. There were guns, swords, and banners. There were witches standing in enchanted rings of pasteboard to tell fortunes. There were teetotums, humming tops, needle cases, pen wipers, smelling bottles, conversation cards, bouquet holders, real fruit made artificially dazzling with gold leaf, imitation apples, pears and walnuts crammed with surprises. In short, a pretty child before me delightedly whispered to another child, her <coughs> bosom friend, there was everything and more. This motley collection of odd objects clustering on the tree like magic fruit and flashing back the bright looks directed towards it from every side, some of the diamond eyes admiring it were hardly on a level with the table, and a few were languishing in timid wonder on the bosoms of pretty mothers, aunts and nurses, made a lively realization of the fancies of childhood and set me thinking on how all the trees that grow and all the things that come into existence on the earth have their wild adornments at that well-remembered time.
12 Days of Christmas, a correspondence by John Julius Norwich. 25th of December. My dearest darling, that partridge in that lovely little pear tree, what an enchanting, romantic, poetic present. Bless you and thank you. Your deeply loving Emily. 26th of December. My dearest darling Edward, the two turtle doves arrived this morning and are cooing away in the pear tree as I write. I am so touched and grateful. With undying love always, Emily. 27th of December. Oh, my darling Edward, you do think of the most original presents. Who ever would have thought of three French hens? Do you think they really come from France? It's a pity that we don't have any chicken coo, but I expect we'll find some. Thank you anyway, they're lovely. Your loving Emily. 28th of December. Dearest Edward, what a surprise. Four calling birds arrived this morning. They are very sweet, even if they do call rather loudly. Oh, they do make telephoning impossible, but I expect they calm down when they get used to their new home. Anyway, I'm terribly grateful. Of course I am. Love from Emily. 29th of December. Dearest Edward, the postman has delivered the most Beautiful gold rings, one for each finger, all five fitting perfectly. A really lovely present, <laughs> lovelier in a way than birds, which do take rather a lot of looking after. The four that arrived yesterday are still making a terrible row, and I'm afraid none of us got much sleep last night. Mummy says she wants to use the rings to wring their necks. She's only joking, I think, though I know what she means. But I love the rings, bless you. 30th of December. Dear Edward, whatever I expected to found, find when I opened the front door this morning, it certainly wasn't six sucking grey geese laying eggs all over the doorstep. Frankly, I'd rather hope you'd stop sending birds. We have no room for them, and they've already ruined the croquet lawn. I know you went well, but can we just call it a halt? Love, Emily. 31st of December. Edward. I thought I said no more birds, but this morning I woke up to no less than seven swans, all trying to get into our goldfish pond. I'd rather not think what happened to the goldfish. The whole house seems full of birds, to say nothing of what they leave behind them. Please, please stop. Your Emily. 1st of January. Frankly, I think I prefer the birds. What am I to do with eight milkmaids and their cows? Is this some kind of a joke? If so, I'm afraid I don't find it very funny. Emily. 2nd of January. Look here, Edward. This has now gone far enough. You say you're sending me nine ladies dancing. All I can say is judging from the way they dance, they certainly are not ladies. <coughs> the village just is not accustomed to seeing a regiment of shameless hussies with nothing on but their lipstick convorting around the village green. And it's mummy and I who get blamed. If you value our friendship, which frankly I am doing less and less, kindly stop this ridiculous behaviour at once. 3rd of January. As I write, ten disgusting old men are prancing all over what used to be my garden before the geese and the swans and the cows got at it. 
several of them, I notice, are taking liberties with the milkmaids. Meanwhile, the neighbours are trying to have us charged. I shall never speak to you again. Emily. 4th of January. This is it. Last straw. You know I detest bagpipes. The place has now become something between a menagerie and a madhouse. And a man from the council has just charged us under the Noise Act 1996. At least money has been spared this last outrage. They took her away yesterday afternoon in an ambulance. I hope you're satisfied. 5th of January. Sir, our client, Miss Emily Wilbraham, instructs me to inform you that with the arrival on her premises of Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra this morning, she has no course left open to her but to seek an injunction to prevent your persistent harassment. I am making arrangements for the return of the much assorted livestock. I am, sir, yours faithfully, G. Creep, Solicitor at Law. Please stand for the blessing. <clears throat> May the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the obedience of Joseph and Mary, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and among you and those whom you love this day and evermore. Amen. Amen.